Hi, I'm Dr. Tony Hampton, a board certified family medicine and obesity medicine doctor with over 22 years of experience in clinical practice, taking care of all kinds of medical problems here with another live presentation because I recognize that in order for my patients to heal, they need to focus on the root cause of disease with a particular focus on nutrition. And the problem is that in my office, I only have about 15 minutes to spend with patients and that's not a long time. Although I try to spend a large percentage of that time teaching nutrition, it seems there's never enough time to teach all the principles that my patients need to be successful. So I made a pledge to my patients that I would provide a video to explain the science behind this whole dietary approach, which we consider low carb, high fat, hopefully with the goal to uh, help you guys incorporate that into your lifestyle. So this Facebook Live and YouTube Live is really a video explaining the science behind this way of eating. And guess what? There'll be a part two to this that'll explain how to incorporate this way of eating into your lifestyle. So if you know anybody who is still questioning this low carb, high fat diet, uh, they don't believe in this keto thing, they're nervous about it, they don't know if it's safe or effective, this is the video for them. Or they're just simply struggling with their diabetes they're struggling with their weight, they're tired or taking medicine, share this video with them and make sure that they subscribe to my YouTube channel so that they will be equipped with the knowledge they'll need to be successful. It's really not that complicated. We just need to understand what we need to know. This video uh, should be repeated by you, by them, because it's a little longer, but it's gonna explain the science. And I wanna make sure that everybody understands what they need to no. So rather uh, you consume it later, you consume it now, just make sure that you do that so that you'll have all the knowledge that you'll need. So let's get started. Keep in mind that this is the 4th of July, so it'll be recorded during the time where we may hear some fireworks in the background. So what I want to do is uh, make sure I can share my screen. And, uh, and when I do that, that'll help me to show some really helpful slides that'll actually help you to see what you need to know. So let's go ahead and do that. And here we go. All right, so now my screen is being shared and I'm gonna put some slides in front of you. And uh, what these slides will do is give you a sense of uh, what this whole protecting the nest and low carb uh, information is all about. So. I'm gonna let my slides upload and then we're gonna get started. And I'm really excited about this. I've been really wanting to have a tool for quite some time. And when you don't have a way to teach in the clinic, it's really frustrating. So I really am happy that I'm at, finally at the point where I can actually teach you guys. So as you know, and as you can see from behind me, it's all about uh, protecting your nest. And that's really what I wanna be able to do is show you what that means and show you how to protect your nest. So let's go ahead and start the, the conversation. And as you already may have heard, if you've heard me speak, the N is for nutrition, it's what you eat. It's also uh, when you eat, and I usually don't eat breakfast. I tend to do intermittent fasting. So that's something I won't talk in detail during this video, but it is important that you understand that it is important to sometimes skip breakfast so you can actually let your body heal. A exercise is the E and it's very important. So we wanna make sure we move our body. Today is an off day for me. I exercise every other day. And then you wanna reduce your stress and get more sleep. So that's gonna be really important. And obviously you wanna have strong thoughts about uh, how you think. And I listen to inspirational people pretty much every day. I encourage you guys to do the same. When I started my podcast this weekend, uh, one of the people I recommended was uh, Anthony Robbins, uh, Jim Rowan, Les Brown, et cetera. Those folk can really help to inspire you. So I want to encourage you guys to have strong thoughts and think positively. So, so this is a question, a quiz. 
So when it comes to the nest, which component do you think is the most important? I want you to, I'm gonna pause for a second and let you ponder that. So we have nutrition, exercise, better sleep, and to reduce stress. So which one do you think is the most important? I think I kind of gave it away. And of course the answer is the first, which is nutrition. Uh, nutrition is like the foundation for everything that you uh, do. Your body needs it. Every cell of your body needs adequate nutrition. Your mitochondria need it, those energy producing cells. So make sure nutrition is number one on your list. How you think is important as well. And if you think positively, I think that'll also be the key to be successful. So, so when it comes to nutrition, you know, it says prevention and healing is grounded in what you feed your body. I just kind of illustrated that. And the me medicine is used to manage your disease. So your medicine doesn't really help to heal you. It just helps to kind of keep things in check. So, so do your doctor a favor, do yourself a favor, do your family a favor and, and start this process of giving your body adequate nutrition. There's no way in the world you'll be healthy depending on needles and and uh, things like that, and, and pills, you need to actually give your body the adequate nutrition that it will need. So the reality of obesity, uh, probably the number one crisis in our country, we need more board certified doctors in obesity, and hopefully that will happen in the very near future. It's a real problem, and it's killing many of our friends, families, neighbors, and it's important that we have a diet that deals with insulin resistance. You may have not heard this, but two out of every three Americans, uh, adults are insulin resistant, meaning they can't uh, get that sugar into the cells properly. The insulin's you know, being overproduced, but it's not working. So this is a study done by uh, Chris Gartner, not the uh, Chris Gartner that uh, Will Smith played, the, the stockbroker guy. I'm talking about the one that was at, I think he was at Stanford. And uh, so the A to Z study was a study that used women in um, this study, and they looked at insulin resistance and things of that nature. It was a 12-month study. And when they did the study, the, they found that insulin resistance strongly influenced how you, um, uh, you know, the diet does seem to matter is what it said. So, so it is, if you look at the graph to the right here, um, if you have a, if you just imagine if you're me and you're a doc and you're, you have a 15 minute appointment, as I mentioned earlier, and you're trying to figure out how am I going to use that time? So if two out of every three Americans are insulin resistant, it would probably make sense to put them on a, a diet that is going to allow them to achieve their goals. So, so as you can see with a low carb diet, you're pretty much going to get weight gain. That's pretty substantial for both types of uh, patients, rather they're insulin sensitive or resistant. Low fat diet works. So those out there who want to take that approach, nothing wrong with that at all. I'm just thinking as we think about the entire population, it's probably much easier for me when I'm making a decision to cater it to the bigger picture, which is most people need to be on a diet that'll help them lose more weight. So that's why I tend to lean in that direction, absolutely support my patients who are vegetarian or vegan, uh, who want to take a different approach. But when I think about all of my patients in total, and to be honest with you, I was a vegetarian for eight years. And during that eight year stint, and many of my patients know this, I encouraged them to be vegetarians. But what I found is that I only got five to 10% to do it. When I shifted to a low carb approach, I, I can get probably 40 to 50% because you can still eat a lot of the things that you enjoy. So here's another uh, study that was published in JAMA in 2012. And it really just kind of helps to help refute this calories in, calories out methodology. And if you've, you've heard that many times, but this calorie in, calorie out way of thinking suggests that if you just eat less and move more, you'll be fine. But as you can see from the slide, towards the bottom here, there's many other factors that determine whether or not you're going to get adiposity or become obese. The, the food quality matters. So if you eat a thousand calories of uh, spinach metabolically, that's going to give you a completely different outcome as a person who eats a thousand cal calories of a slice of cake. So I think it's important that there is, there's a difference uh, in your, what your body does with that 
the quality of the carbohydrates. So, you know, whole grains versus highly processed grains, there's a difference. Obviously, which vegetables or fruit you eat matter. You know, some vegetables are less starchy than others and others are the opposite. The types of fat you eat, even the bacteria in your gut. Uh, in my podcast, uh, Protecting Your Nest, I mentioned bacteroides and firm acute. So if you have the firm acute bacteria, you're going to gain more weight. If you have the bacteroides, you're going to not gain weight. So even the bacteria in your gut, and let's not talk about all the hormones that affect your weight. So just to say move, you know, move more, eat less is just a, a fallacy. So I just wanted to say that out loud. And you can, again, the study was done JAMA 2012. So and then another uh, great graph is uh, the one that shows the A to Z study slightly differently. And if you look up here, this is the zone. And many of you know zone and orange are vegetarian diets. So you can kind of see where they fall. And this is like how much weight they lost going down there. So uh, about 35% for the uh, zone and uh, the uh, learn, which is kind of more of a traditional American diet, did about shockingly uh, 33%. Uh, you know, they're just talking about how much fat's in there. And then, of course, but shockingly to Atkins, which is a little bit of a similar to a low carb diet. Uh, it's not really necessarily high fat. But the key to this graph is to say, wow, Atkins gave the most weight loss and over the uh, 12 months was the most sustainable. So, again, Chris Gartner's study and JAMA is the one you want to look for if you want to get a little confirmation of this. So, again, this is all about the science today. And that's why I want to make sure you understand it's okay to come back to this later. I just want to be able to share this with you. So when you're talking to someone who questions, you know, should I be able to do this? Is it safe? I just want to give you some things to have some talking points about uh, even your doc. You know, sometimes your doc needs to hear this information because they're too busy taking care of you to kind of learn about nutritional science. So here's another nice graph from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey where they looked at folk between the ages of 20 and 74. And they found that when you go back to the uh, 1960s, the obesity rate uh, or prevalence, should I say, was only at 10%. And now we're looking at, and you know, we're already at 20, 20, 10 years from now, we're talking about 50% of the population are going to be obese. But I want you to keep in mind that the timeline here is in the 1960s and 70s. And I think that's important to recall. Uh, so we're really getting close. I mean, we got 10 years and we're talking about half the population is going to be defined as obese. And communities of color, that number is probably already at 50 percent. It's probably going to be at 70 percent or more by the time we get to uh, 2030. So here's another uh, strong graph to illustrate the uh, what's happening. So if we go to the 1970s, right, that's when the uh, dietary guidelines went to the low fat methodology. So these are uh, studies that show an association, you know, uh, in, in science, we like, you know, causation, not association or correlation, but it is nice to just kind of look at this and say, man, it seems like when these dietary guidelines occur, that's when the obesity rate really uh, increased. So I think it's important to notice that correlation, that timeline, when the obesity rate really shot up through the roof. So, so a lot of people realize that there's a lot of medical conditions that are associated with obesity. And I just want to kind of illustrate that. I don't want you to underestimate the negative impact that obesity can have on your body. So let's just take a look at what we have here. And what you see is a ton of medical conditions, even lung conditions. In fact, uh, through the leadership of uh, one of my mentors, Dr. Rick Bone, and I work with uh, Dixie Jarrett, who's uh, one of our uh, marketing leaders within the Advocate Health System. We have a COPD program. And with our COPD classes, we actually teach nutrition, which you wouldn't think of because we know this graph. We know that lung diseases are absolutely correlated. And when it comes to sleep apnea, those folk who snore and they have to use a CPAP machine, those folk, what you find is that the only real cure for that is to lose weight. And I've had patients lose weight and get off the machine. If you don't lose weight, you're pretty much going to be uh, on that machine for the rest of your life. And it's just not cool to have to sleep with a machine. Hypoventilation uh, syndrome is when people who are obese, you can imagine that it's harder to breathe and they may uh, retain more carbon dioxide and uh, not getting enough oxygen 
fatty liver for obvious reasons uh you're gonna stop having fat in the fat because you can't keep stuff in the fat cells so it then shifts to the organs the liver and other organs and of course people uh, who are obese tend to have more gallbladder disease and gynecological issues particularly with polycystic ovarian syndrome my young patients who have that tend to reverse that when they uh, lose weight. And then that'll make their fertility come back. So when I tell people, when you do keto, low carb, and you're doing your fertile years, you need to make sure you wear birth control or protect yourself because you will become more fertile when you uh, lose weight and do this whole lifestyle. Of course, the weight puts pressure on your joints and shockingly, uh, your uh, lifestyle and your weight can affect your skin. Your risk for gout is impacted stroke risk is higher, cataract for all things, and of course, cancer. All the inflammation from excessive weight can cause an increased risk for cancer because of the inflammation in all those cells, and they tend to have uh, defects when they turn over. The ones we tend to think about the most, though, are heart disease, diabetes, and hypertension. Those are the ones that are uh, hurting us the most, probably, but I just wanted to just give you a sense that uh, although you have people in your family who are overweight and have done fine, the reality is that most people who are overweight don't do fine. And this next graph illustrates that when you think about the mortality rate. Nobody ever thinks about this. And I know in communities of color, we uh, I think about um, uh, uh, Martin Lawrence playing Big Mama's House, you know, in those types of movies, which I love, by the way. Uh, they're very funny. But, but, uh, but the, the problem is this. Um, a lot of times the larger adults in our family who make it to 80 or 90 give us a misperception of reality. The reality is what you see on this graph. And what you see on this graph is that, yeah, if you're in the normal weight, uh, weight range, you got an 80% chance of making it to 70, which is pretty statistically good. If you're in an overweight category, you have about a 60%. So that's like BMI of 30 to 40. But if you get into the BMI of 40 range, you only have a 50% chance of making it to 70. So you went from a 80% chance of making it to uh, 70, and now you're down to only 50%. I do not like to play uh, those types of numbers. If I'm a lottery player, I'm not going to be too excited about that, that chances of winning. So, so I just want you to see that just to make it real to you, that it's not only those chronic illnesses that I share with you, it's also the mortality rate is significantly different. So, so fat's not the culprit. I think you guys may have heard this from me. I, I tweeted something on Twitter, the American uh, Carl College of Cardiology, a couple of weeks ago, uh, made a statement saying fat is okay. And we've been told low fat all these years. So I just want you to understand fat is not the problem. It's really more about sugars, starches, and grains. And uh, I really have to drive that home because not only, not, not only are you struggling with that reality, my clinical colleagues are still they're in that old mindset. And a lot of these studies I, I shared with you so far are all like old. I mean, if then they're like 10 years old. We've been knowing this forever. Why did it take the American College of Car Cardiology this long? Why did it take the American Diabetes Association so long to say that low carb is okay? In fact, but I will say this, if you hadn't heard it, the president or the CEO of the uh, American Diabetes Association uh, uh, was on insulin, and I think she's down to one medicine after being on insulin, four medicines, doing a low-carb diet. She got off her insulin, and she should be off her medicine completely shortly. So now they're saying it's okay because their leader uh, benefited from it, and she did it all with diet. So you just got to know that fat's not the problem at all. So there's a lot of dietary myths. So let's just look a little bit at some of the history and the... Um, the Maasai tribe, um, uh, they eat a high fat diet. I think they eat the buffalo. I think that's the uh, animal they eat. And they're a nomadic people and they, they just eat the flesh of the cattle. Imagine just eating the flesh of the cattle and um, the milk and the blood of the cattle. That sounds like a carnivore diet, right? Uh, and if you look at these uh, gentlemen and, uh, and ladies, uh, I think it may just be guys, um, if you look at them, they're all lean, right? So they eat animal, milk, and blood, and there's no obesity. So it tells you a lot about that way of eating. And obesity is not a big issue at all. In fact, they not only are they thin people, but they actually have metrics because they've studied these folk. And 
their, their metrics, you know, the things we measure, cholesterol and all of those things, blood pressure, they're all wonderful. So we know that they're not being harmed by this diet, but we are being harmed by what Dr. Uh, or should I say Ansel Keys, he was more of a PhD, if I recall, scientist guy. And he's, he, he did the uh, study, uh, the seven country study, where he uh, really looked at 22 countries and he uh, kind of only went to seven because they correlated to what he wanted us to believe, which is that saturated fat causes heart disease. But what we found is that some countries like Mexico and France, and you've heard of the French paradox, how is it that people in France eat all this fatty food and yet they don't get a lot of heart disease? That's because there's no correlation between fat and heart disease. So I think it's really important to understand that and, and know that. So it was a misinterpretation of the science uh, that led to that information, which really hurt so many people. So I really uh, regret that happened. And I just hope we can turn this thing back around. In 1969, imagine that beautiful uh, commercial, beautiful woman uh, giving us a dietary tip. And, and look, if you look at this, and it's hard to see, it says nibble on a cookie about an hour before lunch. How about that? That's a dietary tip. Uh, sugar keeps your energy up and your appetite down. So, of course, I can't blame the sugar industry. They're trying to make a buck. But I do care about you, and I don't want you guys to consume this uh, type of information. Sugar is fat-free. So, you see, what happens is when you start to... Um, you know, demonize fat, then you only got, you know, carbs and um, protein left. So people, so what they did is they put a whole lot of sugar and carbs into things because we were trying to avoid fat. It was the wrong thing to do. And as you could imagine, the obesity epidemic soon followed. And then we get these messages about, you know, high cholesterol because cholesterol and fat are kind of lumped together. And the bad news is that you can't eat your bacon and eggs is what they were saying back in 1984 on the cover of Time magazine. And when things, you know, hit the cover of a magazine, you know, like Time magazine back then, I know we're virtual now, but I'm be, I'm be honest with you, when people see that, it really does affect their decisions because it's kind of scary. Nobody wants to leave this planet early. Now, all of a sudden, you know, 15 years later, in 1999, they're saying cholesterol is good. And what's scary about my uh, information today is you're probably wondering, what about you, Doc? You're probably in the same boat as uh, as uh, these folk and that we're going to be like on a roller coaster, not knowing what to believe. But always remember that the hunters and gatherers have always eaten uh, a low carb, high fat diet. They basically hunted during the day and probably fasted in the morning while they were hunting. And and when they came back with the meat, that's what they ate. They ate berries and nuts and seeds and things of that nature. They they didn't, you know, they, they couldn't eat. They didn't have meals back then. They didn't have like all these grains. They couldn't eat that because they didn't have the technology. So we've this sort of, if you could argue that the uh, low carb, high fat diet is the most, the oldest diet that's ever existed, right? So, because it's been around forever. So, so I think it's important to keep things in perspective. And as you can see um, in 2014, six years ago, uh, we're now saying fat's okay. Now, the irony is that most of the folk in the clinical world up until very recently, and I would still say now, are still saying low fat's the way to go. So, so we have a lot of work to do. This is why I'm doing this right now. I know I'm not going to reach everybody, but I figure if I can just reach some people and start to spread the gospel that there's a better way. I think that's exactly what we'll need to do. By the way, I know that I'm looking at my slides and some people may be asking questions. I'll probably uh, answer questions after the broadcast and or over the next few days because of the fact that it's a long video. And I just want to get this information out so that you'll have it, my patients will have it, the world will have it. So the history of misinformation, if you look back in the 1950s, warning signs showed that there was a connection between, you know, sugar and heart disease, right? So that's what the false information was. And then, and that was based on that research that was false. But what's worse is that in the 1960s, Harvard researchers paid by the sugar industry, and they were paid to link fat to heart disease. So there was a little mischievous stuff going on back then, unfortunately. And then so the blame shifted away from sugar uh, uh, and, um, 
and the report singled out saturated fat as the cause. And that was really probably more for profit than anything. So from the 70s to the 80s to the 90s, 2000s and beyond, media, public health authorities, food industry promoted a low-fat, high-carb diet. That's why even as I speak to you now, you're still struggling with this because you've been told all these years that that's the way to go. And the food manufacturers are like, if that's the way to go, let's flood the market with the, the these types of highly processed food. They don't have a lot of fat in it, but they're highly processed, a lot of sugar, these hydrogenated fats. And, and, and if you think about all the family members that you lost during these years, it should really upset you that uh, we've been given misinformation. For lack of knowledge, some of those folk would have probably lived a little bit longer, which is why I'm so passionate about on a 4th of July holiday, and I've spent plenty of time with my family today, I'm giving you this information because I absolutely believe that somebody's going to hear it and it's going to change their life. So here's another study that was published in Lipids. Now look at the date, uh, 2008. 2008, we got this study and it says that under different metabolic condition, saturated fat is processed differently. So let's imagine you're on a, a low fat diet, which is the kind of diet people have promoted for years. What happens is that your primary fuel becomes sugar because it's a low fat diet. That means you have a high carb diet. And what happens is the, this, these big bubbles here are like what's happening inside your, uh, uh, your blood, right? So if you eat, so whatever your fuel is, is what you're going to consume, right? So if you eat a low fat diet, you're not going to consume fat. So it's just going to float around in your arteries and clog them up. The opposite of what you would think, right? Then you have a, a low carb diet where your primary fuel, and in this study was less than 45 grams a day. And because you're using fat as your fuel, because you're not using carbs, you uh, actually consume the fat in your artery. So and so because your primary fuel is saturated fat or fat. So, so when you eat fat and that becomes your fuel, you actually burn it and you remove it from your body. It's just, a, so it's amazing what happens when you understand how this works and it just gives you an aha moment. And this is one of those studies when I wrote my first book, Fix Your Diet, Fix Your Diabetes, and I was doing research, when I saw this study, it just kind of blew my mind. I'm like, oh my God, this whole time I thought if you eat fat, it'll clog up your arteries. And then I saw this study, it was just the opposite. So I want you to really remember this study. Now I need to take a drink before I actually comment on this. The American um, Heart Association is um, receiving funding from all the organizations on this graph. The ones that kind of stand out though, would be Coca-Cola. Shout out to Coca-Cola, no, you know, no problem with Coca-Cola, General Mills, Kellogg, and uh, Mars Food Companies, uh, Pepsi Co as well. The reason why I'm pointing them out is because a lot of their products do have a lot of sugar in it. And I just think that if you're just a rational person, uh, and these are, there's nothing wrong with these companies per se, there's nothing wrong with the people that work for them. But my point is, if you're getting funding from companies that make products that are harmful potentially, then there's a conflict of interest, right? So I, you know, I just wish our heart associations could be funded independent of industry and that would be much better. So I just want you to understand there's bias in some of the recommendations you get from these organizations. So, so think about this. I know it's hard to imagine and you and, and I'm going to do a sugar demonstration shortly, but Look at all this sugar that we consume on average by the average American, 152 pounds of sugar. So if you got any sugar in the house, I want you to go get that sugar bag and imagine how many of those bags you're going to consume throughout the year. And then you wonder why we're sick, right? Why we have so much obesity and so much diabetes. So, so let's think about what happens. Um, a lot of my patients say to me, you know, doc, you don't understand. I love bread. I'm a, and when I mention bread, they like literally just start melting in front of me. They just love it. They love sugar. They love starch. And they say, doc, you don't understand. I do understand. I think most of us are addicted to sugar. And this is what happens. You, you eat the sugary, delicious uh, uh, item. And, and then all of a sudden what happens is that um, those, those dopamine, uh, all that good stuff, endorphin, all that good stuff happens. So it feels good. It tastes good. 
And it's just something that you just can't resist, right? And then your body says, there's a lot of sugar floating around, so I need to make insulin. And what insulin will do is make that sugar go back down, right? And so now it's gone back down. What happens when your sugar goes back down? Well, uh, obviously you're gonna maybe get hungry again. So you're gonna start craving the food again. And, and, and one of the things I love about eating a low carb, high fat diet is that when I fast in the morning, I'm not even hungry. I do drink a lot of water. I have some water with me right now, but I don't really get hungry because I'm not on this roller coaster. And imagine the chances of getting upset stomach, headache, uh, not being in a good mood because you're on a roller coaster, always looking for food. So we're trying to get you off of this little addiction cycle. And I think it's important to kind of remember these images to remind you of that. As you know, the number one cause of uh, death in this country is heart disease and in the world, and over a million people every month succumb to uh, heart disease. So it's a big deal and it's killing a lot of people. It's a, over a million a month, that's a lot of folk. But what you may not know is that um, back in 1975, only 7% of those who got uh, bypass surgeries were diabetics. Now it's 37% of those who get bypass surgery. So it sounds like diabetes is a huge risk factor for heart disease. In fact, this is gonna blow your mind. So just imagine you have a twin brother and your twin brother had a heart attack or a twin sister. If they had a heart attack, their chance of getting a subsequent heart attack is super high for obvious reasons they just had one. Did you know that if you're a diabetic, your risk for having a heart attack is equal to that person who just had a heart attack just because you're diabetic? So the good news is type 2 diabetes is completely reversible with uh, this type of diet and intermittent fasting. So I wouldn't worry about it. I just want you to understand that we have to eliminate the diabetes so that we can eliminate the rest. And even type 1s do really well eating this way. They, just, they, they may have to still take insulin, but maybe they don't have to take 50 units a day. We can get it down to 10 to 15 units a day. So that's what we're trying to do. So uh, evidence is, uh, is, is really important. I know it's important as a physician, and I'm just trying to give you more and more evidence. So let's just look back at that A to Z study with uh, uh, Chris Gardner. And if you look at that study, you know, four times the weight loss achieved by following a low carb uh, diet versus a low fat diet. So again, if you're going to compare apples and apples, why would you choose a diet that's less effective unless you just, you know, if you're if you are eating like a vegetarian diet because you, you're concerned about the planet and animals, then that's fine. I get that. I can't argue against that logic. But if, you, if you're beyond that and you're just looking at data and what's the best diet, I want you to consider this way of eating. By the way, you can be a vegetarian, Mediterranean diet, and you can also do low carb with those diets as well. So that doesn't exclude anybody from the key is to reduce the things that are harming us. So this study is very interesting. It was one of those studies where they controlled the, uh, you know, uh, it was a calorie controlled feeding study. Uh, this is a study essentially where they lost weight already. Everybody had lost weight on a low fat, a low glycemic, a low diet and a high fat diet. So everybody lost weight. But the question is how hard would it, would it be to maintain that weight loss, right? Uh, so that's really important. And, and by the way, the best way to maintain weight loss after you lose weight is to exercise. I just want to throw that out there. Exercise doesn't really help you lose weight as much as you thought, but it does help you to maintain weight loss because your body is going to fight against it. So now look at this. So if you've lost weight and you were at 3,300 calories to maintain your weight, right? And then you lost weight, correct? What they're saying in this graph is that if you are a low fat diet person, you would have to reduce your calorie, uh, calories to 2,800 versus 3,300. So essentially about a 500 calorie drop to maintain it, right? Then they got the low glycemic low diet, which is more like at around you know 2,950. But what I love about the high fat diet, which is the one we promote, is that you only have to go down to about, you know, 3150. Uh, so maybe, you know, maybe 150 or so calories less than what you were accustomed to. So just logically, which diet do you think will be the easiest to maintain, right? It'll be the uh, high fat diet. So I just wanna just put this in front of you. This is some data that was in JAMA in 2012. So again, another reason, and it does explain why 
patients in my clinic do much better with the low carb diet in terms of being able to maintain it. So high fat diets are supported by research. And in this study, not only are they good for the things we spoke about, they actually promote longevity. And I think the main reason is because of uh, reduced risk for cancer. And um, what I always tell my patients is that cancer loves uh, sugar. So if anybody's ever had a PET scan, all they do is inject sugar into your arm and the, and the sugar goes to the fast replicating cells, which are the cancer cells, because they gobble up sugar. So you literally starve the cancer cells when you eat a high fat diet. So although there's still much research to be done, the initial studies would suggest that when you eat a ketogenic or a low carb, high fat diet, and again, the big difference between those two is that maybe you're at 20 carbs a day for keto. Uh, some would argue 50, and then you're a little bit higher up the, the, uh, the carb scale when you're low carb, high fat. Some people say less than 100. I'm pretty much at 50 for low carb, high fat, and, and 20. That's just my personal metric. It depends on who you talk to. At the end of the day, motor uh, function, uh, memory, and uh, the decreased incidence of tumors in this study done in cell metabolism in 2017. It's just nice to know that if I eat this way, my risk for cancer. So if I have a family history for cancer, I'm really going to be inspired to consider this way of eating. So here's another interesting uh, way of looking at things. And uh, burning fat as primary energy means, you know, using fat for your fuel, which we talked about. So fat is just a better, uh, cleaner source of fuel. And so it's like a solar panel because you don't get all those byproducts. We already know, even before you heard this lecture, that sugar causes inflammation and, and, and starchy vegetables and of, of course, sugar and, and um, the grains all break down into glucose, but they're all inflammatory to the body. So if I have arthritis, I don't want that inflammation. All those conditions I showed you earlier are going to be worse because of all that starchy shit. So we don't want to have this, this, this factory effect on our body. We want to have a solar panel effect that's cleaner, more efficient, and doesn't cause all that inflammation. So Let's talk a little bit real quick about these macronutrients and, 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 and find a balance with them. So let's look at this uh, graph. I think this is one of the graphs that I think you want to remember because it really helps to uh, illustrate what happens when you eat these three macronutrients. These are the only macronutrients that you make. And by the way, I have to say this out loud. There are only essential amino acids which turn into protein. There is only essential fatty acids, which turn into fat. There's no such thing as an essential carb. So all those years when we were taught by our, you know, our grandparents, you got to have your starch. No, you don't have to have a starch. It's not essential. You can have a starch, but it's not essential. So when you look at this graph, you'll see that the uh, carbohydrates cause a spike. And when you get up here at the top of this peak, you're going to have uh, increased production of insulin which is going to cause it to go down. And, and then you're in that cycle that I showed you earlier. Everybody's had Chinese food. And because of the rice, you're like always hungry a couple of hours later. Now you see why, because this is when you get hungry down here. Tastes great going in. Don't get me wrong. I love Chinese food. But then when it comes down, you get, and you know, so what we do in our home, we actually use, when we make our own uh, Chinese food, we use cauliflower rice and to avoid this uh, this peak. Because cauliflower won't, uh, it's not really a starchy vegetable. This is like some grilled chicken here at protein. And then, of course, the fat, avocados, and things of that nature. So if you imagine eating an egg omelet for breakfast, it'll probably be right in between this fat and this protein. It's sustainable. You see how that fat's kind of sustainable so you don't get those peaks and valleys and all that up and down, headache, upset stomach, irritable mood. It's just a better way to eat. So always remember this graph which shows the three macronutrients. Now, I always joke with my patients. I say, well, my goal is to keep you above ground, not below ground. So why not eat above ground vegetables instead? So this, this graph, and you can always go back and look at this, just shows the things that are, grow above ground. And if you notice, the above ground vegetables do not have a lot of carbs. Uh, those numbers, in fact, almost everything up here is five carbs or less. So it's really nice to be able to eat things like this. And then 
yeah, you can have some starchy uh, vegetables periodically, but we tend to avoid in my home the sweet potatoes and potatoes. By the way, sweet potatoes are a little better than the white potato, and I think you know that uh, because they have a lot of uh, fiber but and, and other nutrients. But at the end of the day, we try to avoid these types of starchy things or you know, kind of cut back on them. And then you have the uh, carbs that are uh, really highly refined, and I would just consider them garbage carbs. So bread is an example, and you know, uh, even the uh, whole wheat is still a highly refined grain. So you try to avoid bread if you can. Uh, most cereal are garbage, and even the ones that are very popular because they're known for fiber and things, ultimately you look at the carbs and you'll find that the numbers are high. And then pasta is really just flour, right? So when you think about eating flour, do you really want to feed your baby's flour? Uh, how about zucchini pasta instead, right? And we'll talk a little bit about what to eat in the second video, which talks about how to do this. And then, of course, we have rice and we have potatoes. They're all starchy. Those are probably the biggest culprits because they're staples in our home. You can actually eat beans. There's a lot of fiber. So let's just say you have some cauliflower, mac and cheese, for example. It's only four carbs for a serving. Then you have some beans that's like 24 carbs, but assuming you subtract the fiber, you can get that down to 18. So you got 18 net carbs, four, you got 22 net carbs. Your meat doesn't have anything on it that's you know like sauce or anything. That's not a bad way to go. So you can eat beans, but you need to understand that they tend to be you know, 20 carbs, 24 carbs versus the cauliflower, which tends to be four. And then they have chestnuts as an example. So and then when it comes to fruit, as a keto, low-carb, high-fat guy, I'm really big on berries. Berries are the way to go. And even blueberries, which, they, you know, it looks a little deceiving because it says 12, but there's something about blueberries in terms of how they process in the body. So unlike the other, uh, you know, fruit that's at 12, it's, it's probably still safe to eat the blueberries. It's kind of weird. But, of course, we, we're going to lean towards these over here, but I eat blueberries all the time. What we tend to eat historically are, you know, watermelon and bananas and grapes. And those are probably, I mean, if you think about it, a really ripe grape, uh, banana could have as many as 26 carbs. So if you divide 20 even by four, that's five teaspoons of sugar versus one teaspoon of sugar with these berries. So if you're trying to do this type of eating, you want to shift towards a diet where you eat berries instead of the grapes, for example. And once you do that, your berries... Particularly, my blueberries taste like my grapes at this point because my taste buds have changed. So don't be afraid to try that. I think you'll love that way of eating once you your palate changes and get accustomed to it. There was a doctor. I, I, I tried to find him before the presentation, but a doctor, unlike my, you know, who came up with this meal uh, mnemonic. So shout out to the doctor who did that. And but what he shared was that you want to have your meat. You, you want to have your eggs, your added fat, and your leaves. And, and it doesn't really matter what animal that you eat, as long as you don't cover your uh, your pork chops. If these are pork chops, don't cover it with uh, with the flour. The flour is the starch. This is, looks like chicken breast and the steak. Just don't cover the uh, these animals with cornmeal and flour because uh, a tablespoon of cornmeal a tablespoon of flour is equivalent to a half a tablespoon of sugar. Don't cover the uh, ribs, which I did have today, with barbecue sauce, just eating without the barbecue sauce. The eggs, uh, fat and cholesterol in your diet is not going to harm you. So uh, there's a few exceptions uh, who have genetic issues, and those people will know it but based on their labs. So you should be able to eat the whole egg without problem. So most people can eat a whole egg, a couple of eggs a day and not have any problems at all. I do it pretty much every day. Added fat, we want to use the right fats. I'll illustrate that uh, in a little bit. But the bottom line is in leafy, you know, you non-starchy vegetables, that's what you want. Non-starchy vegetables, that's going to be the key. So, so, so what you want to know is that there's a difference between fats. There are good fats and bad fats. This illustration shows that the fats that you get out of salmon, avocado, those are considered the good fats. And the nuts and seeds, of course, are good fats. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, the anti-inflammatory fats. And then the nut butter. So even when I make a smoothie, I'll have avocado in it. I'll have nut butters in it. 
uh, like almond butter, things like that. You can eat all of that, no problem. Those are the good fats. Then you have the inflammatory fats. The problem with the pizza is not the toppings, it's the um, crust. And the crust is, again, flour, a tablespoon of flour is a half a tablespoon, tablespoon of sugar. So you want to just know these things, and then that way you'll know how to interpret it. The uh, margarine, that's that hydrogenated uh, principle I mentioned earlier. You don't, you don't, so when we overly process things, that's what happens. Potato chips, who doesn't love potato chips? But they're inflammatory. And then, of course, a, uh, a little uh, cupcake uh, can be a problem. So let's just understand hydrogenated oils are problematic. And, and I think the rule of thumb is if it was man made and we went into the lab and did something to it, we did it for a reason. We wanted to make these oils uh, shelf stable. So we did some chemical changes to them so that they would be solids at room temperature. They last on the shelf longer. It's really all done for profit. They probably did know they were harming us back then, but I could, um, but they certainly know now. So we want to avoid those types of things. And, uh, and they say, you know, it's just not worth it because they increase the risk of, uh, uh, trans fats, which uh, can lead to heart disease. So I just, I'll, I'll end that comment with that. So man-made fats, the margarines, the uh, butter spreads, uh, anything that's, they, they really outlaw trans fats, but I would still avoid, you know, anything that's like artificially made. We're going to get the real stuff. And the irony is that the highly processed oils, which sound healthy, corn oil, isn't that made from corn? No, it's actually made from a seed. Uh, canola oil, these are made from seeds, right? So it's a little deceiving because they, they show the name of the vegetable and they say it's an oil, but they're really, at least cottonseed oil, they're honest in calling it seed. And that's what we use to make Crisco. And we took Crisco off the market because it was making the wrong kind of fats that were inflammatory. So I would avoid these highly processed oils. You can always come back to the section of the video and, and realize that they give you too many omega-6s, which causes inflammation. So I know it's kind of hard to hear this because you have some of this stuff on your shelf right now. You're probably looking at it while you're uh, listening to my voice. So, uh, but that's okay. You know, we, we grow through knowledge and that's what we do. We change. So I learned from one of my colleagues, Boca was mouth in Spanish and so I'm very much into butter. Now, grass-fed butter may be better. We don't know, but it seems better. But, you know, you do what's in your budget. Olive oil, only the, the butter and the olive oil are not for high temperatures, right? You can take the butter and turn into ghee, which is like clarified butter where you get the, you know, you, you boil it and, and, and get the part that's the thicker part. But ultimately, and you can cook, you can use ghee at high temperatures, but not butter and not olive oil. You want to use the coconut and avocado oil at the higher temperatures. But these are the ones that are cold pressed. If you think about it, if you take an olive, right, and you squeeze it, you're going to get oil, right? So, you know, it's cold pressed. You don't have to do anything special. You have to really process a, a, a seed a lot to get any oil out of it. So you could imagine what all that processing is going to be a problem. So let's stick with the boca. There's other types of oils that are healthy, macadamia, nut oil, et cetera. But I just wanted to give you just something that's easy to remember. And these are the ones that give you the omega-3, which is the healthier fat. So, so really, it's all about you know living low carb and how do you do it? You got to learn how to read labels. I do recommend that when you're getting started that you can kind of subtract the fiber. So you look at the label, you see 27 carbs. You can subtract the fiber, get net carbs. Your goal for me personally, I tell my patients, uh, get down to 50 less a day. Now, if you're just getting started and you're at 300 carbs, right, you probably need to go to 200, do that for a while, come go to 100. But if you're going to really reverse diabetes and obesity and some of these other chronic insulin resistant conditions, you really need to get those numbers really low uh, to 50 or less. So I just want to make you aware. It's not about the product per se. You know, what should I eat, doc? Well, you need to look at the label. Uh, there's a good app called um, uh, Carb Manager, Carb, C-A-R-B Manager, that you can put on your phone. And then there's a, a good book called Calorie King, Carb and Fat Edi Edition. Get the large print. That'll give you a book if you're not into apps. Learn how to count carbs so that you'll then know how to get that number down. And you're gonna, it's gonna be an eye-opening experience when you look at the 
different products that you thought were healthy. And you're going to be like, oh, my God, I didn't know it had this many carbs in it. Raisin Bran probably has 38 carbs. Soda has 38 carbs. And that's the, so they both have about nine teaspoons of sugar. But that's the type of homework you're going to need to do after you uh, finish this presentation. So here's uh, a couple of examples of why calories shouldn't be your focus, because these both have the same number of calories. And I want to do a shout out to Diet Doctor. Uh, I'm part of their expert panel that helps to look at data and decide if it's, you know, uh, legit. And you can go to dietdoctor.com. You'll, you'll see me on that expert panel. You'll see a great resource, probably one of the best in the country that help guide patients and docs. They got uh, continuing medical education for free. And they also have a course that will teach you low carb as well. I, I suggest you guys uh, sign up for that. And I think that's all, you know, within uh, it's either free or, you know, very affordable. I think it's free. So but look at this information here and you'll see that on their website for uh, Diet Doctor, they have a low carb chocolate cake. That low carb chocolate cake has about six or seven carbs. Right. So there's a way for you to make something that tastes just like this without using sugar and flour. But the point of this slide is to say they have the same number of calories, but completely different numbers of carbs. And it goes back to what I told you about this calories in, calories out. Do you really think the salad's going to impact your body the same way as this, uh, this uh, brownie? And the answer is, of course, the brownie's going to hurt you more. So be aware of those differences. And that's why I want you to stop counting calories. So this is another one that's going to hurt some of you guys because oatmeal has 23 carbs and this egg omelet only has two. And you've been told for years, eat the uh, oatmeal because it's good for your cholesterol. Well, I'm going to suggest that the egg omelet uh, is probably better for your cholesterol. It's, it's just hard to swallow these pills. But what I'm saying, if you once you adapt to reducing the thing that causes the most harm, insulin resistance, obesity, diabetes, which is the carbs, you'll realize that maybe I shouldn't have the oatmeal. The good news is the cheese omelet tastes pretty good. So although it's kind of painful to learn the truth because you've been doing it for a while, it's probably not going to be that hard to shift. So let's do this, this sugar demonstration. When we, uh, we do our healthy living programs, we always like to make it dramatic. So I just want you to see something that we shared uh, live, but we'll do it this way for you guys. So you start your day with grits. That's very uh, common in a lot of cultures. And as you can see, 29 carbs, 15 cubes of sugar. And we're just getting started, guys. So we start breakfast with 15 cubes of sugar, right? And that is not the best way to start, especially if you're diabetic. And uh, I remember that song, Two All Beef Patty Special Sauce, Lettuce, Cheese, Pickles, Onions on a Sesame Seed Bun. It's amazing how good of a marketing campaign that was. But the Big Mac has 46 carbs, 28 teaspoons, uh, 28 cubes of uh, sugar, and then the French fries, of course. You got to get those, right? And that's got 44 carbs and 27 cubes of sugar. So we're we're just getting started. Of course, for dinner, I, I love fried chicken. So, you know, I got 27 carbs. The chicken doesn't have carbs until you put flour on it. So if I get chicken that's grilled, no problem. KFC sells grilled chicken if you're not cooking. Mac and cheese, if it's not made of cauliflower but made of pasta, it's going to have 45 to 50 or so carbs, 54 in this example. And then cornbread, 35 carbs. And you can see the teaspoons of sugar, 13, 31, and 21. Pretty big numbers. And of course, we got a snack on some chips at the end of the day. So we're going to allow for some snacks. And of course, you know, when we go get our uh, meal, uh, our two all beef patties, we got to have a, a Coke with it. And you can see it's 57 carbs. That's a lot of uh, the cubes of sugar is probably a little off, but the carbs are definitely spot on. So let's let's compare it to a, a healthy plan. So now all of a sudden you're not eating grits, but who who wouldn't mind bacon sausage, right? Uh, you know, an egg. So we're going to do bacon and egg in this example, and then we're going to have a little uh, fruit to top it off. As you can see, there's not much carbs and protein. So it's pretty guiltless eating based on the methodology we're sharing here today. And then when you look at the, we're going to have a, a, a chicken salad. So it's a generous chicken salad and we have a, a dressing to go with it. I tend to ask folk to get fatty dressings and the ones that don't have a lot of carbs in it. So just keep that in mind. 
And then you have a uh, Parmesan uh, crusted uh, uh, tilapia. So we got some fish, some vegetables, and some cauliflower rice. As you can see, 6.65 .6, and 5 carbs for that meal. And that's not a bad way to go. And then we're going to do a little jello for snack, popcorn, and, and pork rings, which is interesting. So yes, pork rings don't have any uh, carbs at all. Uh, so I'm not suggesting it's a health food, but I'm suggesting that if you're trying to not have an elevated sugar, it's probably not a bad way to go. So keep that in mind as well. And then we're going to have some beverages. I'm going to get a little drink of water again. We're not going to put sugar in our coffee. You can use a little stevia if you want to. Um, they do have some keto creamers you can use. We're not doing sweet tea. That's just like drinking soda. So if you have the right beverage as opposed to the soda from the previous example. So here we are. They recommend about 50 uh, carbs a day here is what I'm recommending. And we pretty much got that with our healthier version at 53. And uh, it was actually pretty cost effective too. Uh, Cause when you cook at home, you don't spend a lot of money. And then you look at the unhealthy version and you would think I was kidding, but 300 carbs for a day is what you just experience, and it's not that uncommon. So I don't want you to think that um, this is not like, oh, no way I'm doing 300 carbs. I'm sure most of us can imagine that we've had days where we've eaten what I've showed you. So, so it's really important to understand with this sugar demonstration is that if you don't pay attention to the numbers, you'll then, uh, I mean, just imagine all of these uh, teaspoons of sugar in your body. It's just ridiculous. So we don't want that. So, so that's pretty much the why. And the next video is going to show you more about the how. And so what I want you to do is to just digest this information, maybe even think about sharing this with somebody who needs to hear it. And by doing that, you may actually uh, save their life. I just think that it's really important that we share information with our friends and family who are who may be struggling. And uh, I think that I really believe that this information is gonna be life-saving for many of you. So, so although I have another video to do uh, that speaks about part two, which is the uh, how, I just wanted to get this information out. I think it's important that you have this information. I think you should share it with friends and family. And I promise you, if you start following these present, uh, this this per perspective I just gave you, I guarantee you're going to be healthier. So, so enjoy the rest of your day, and thank you for uh, enjoying time with me. And I promise to keep sharing all this information every single day. Have a great evening.